Uh, Dr. Pinsky is the, uh, the chair of the physics department at University of Houston, and um, he's also, uh, I think I told some people earlier, um, he's also got an interesting background. He's also an attorney, and which he became after studying physics. So, um, and, he, and his uh, research actually has a lot to do with the, um, the Large Hadron Collider at CERN. And I think he's um, taken what? Three groups there through Quarknet or something like that. Uh, well, we've actually taken a couple, and and we one of our Quarknet teachers actually uh, was selected out of the five total from the whole U.S. Uh, to go to uh, to get three weeks at CERN. He's a high school teacher. Oh, our outreach program. Okay, so um, and I, I went over the um, abstract today, but what he's going to talk about is Metapix, and it's essentially adapting some technology from CERN to use for uh, dosimetry. So uh, that I'll turn over to Dr. Pinsky. Okay. Uh, well, I guess I don't know if everybody can see the board there. This is I don't have to worry about that. Um, the Metapix collaboration is a CERN-based collaboration, as you can see here, a list of all the universities and groups that are members of it. And there's only two from the U.S. as uh, the Space Science Lab at Berkeley and us at the University of Houston. It's uh, uh, just a little word of, of why you know such a collaboration got formed. The technology we're going to talk about was developed at CERN uh, for use at the LHC, at the uh, Large Hadron Collider as part of those experiments. And in Europe, uh, kind of different from the way we do things here, the universities, especially the physics departments, tend to have very professional engineering groups. You know, that is rather than have, you know, you hire an oddball engineer or technician when you need them and that kind of thing, they actually have a full staff of technicians and engineers uh, who are full time and support the effort of the group and then are part of the collaboration. So these groups are not the physics groups at these universities, but the uh, engineering groups who worked on the electronics. And uh, they uh, got to the point where uh, they realized that the that this technology had potential applications outside of uh, the LHC. So uh, what we're going to talk about is uh, the Metapix 2 chip and its readout system, uh, some recent heavy ion exposures, uh, and, and uh, high intensity therapy exposures that we did and what we plan to do with it. Uh, so the, uh, the Metapix detector is a pixel-based detector technology, as we'll see. It can be employed to look at charged particles as well as photons, everything from infrared through gamma, uh, and as well as neutrons. And basically it's based upon a readout chip. So the, the point of this technology is that the chip is a large-scale integrated circuit, which is on the bottom. And you can connect it to any sort of detector material that's reasonable to do so. We currently use what's known as bump bonding, I'll show you how that works in a minute, uh, to uh, attach the detector layer uh, to the, the underlying readout chip. And again, uh, for our purposes, we tend to just use silicon. It works fine. So it's a semiconductor, we use n-type silicon. And uh, we put a little p-type layer down to make it a diode. I'll explain why in a second here. Uh, this is a picture of the bumps. These are solder bumps. It's a, a, a fantastic technology. And so they deposit these things like eggs on the uh, underlying subsurface. And then uh, they can essentially bond the detector material to it. So the detector is monolithic. It's not, uh, it's not broken down into pixels. So there's a charge deposited in the detector, divides through the silicon, and is picked up by the pads uh, on the chip in a simple charge division way. And the, the ability to make these things is just incredible. Uh, it's the most expensive part. Sometime we'll get the question, how much does this cost? The solder bumps are the most expensive part of the whole process, and it costs right now something on the order of about two, three hundred dollars a chip okay. uh, to do this. Uh, it, we could come up with a way to directly deposit say by epitaxial techniques, the detector layer on the chip, it would be a better process, but uh, we're not yet doing that. This is a, a cross-section of how the, the uh, detector works, or how the, the combination works. You have uh, monolithic silicon, it's N-type silicon. There's a P-type implant uh, at the bottom, and here's the solder 
bump that connects the two uh, luminized uh, pads together here. The chip is down here with the electronic circuitry, which we'll talk about in a minute. And then there's an aluminum uh, contact layer on the, the top and uh, we apply a bias voltage, a high voltage bias to it. It's reverse bias, so this acts like a big diode. So you have a, a reverse bias on it. And the reason that you reverse bias it, assuming people know a little bit about a semiconductor electronics, is that uh, in a semiconductor, it is a semiconductor, it's not an insulator, and it's not a full conductor, but when you apply a voltage to it, you typically get a current. It flows. Not a big current, but it's it's a you know compared to the small amount of charge we'll deposit by ionizing radiation, it's pretty substantial. So uh, because of the way the PN junction functions, when you reverse bias it, you deplete the charge carriers in the surrounding semiconductor layer, and it becomes a, a very good insulator when it's reverse bias. So the current goes in in principle to zero. Because it's, it's a, a device that uh, suffers the vagaries of uh, statistical mechanics, uh, you wind up having um, thermal noise that is a couple of the electrons are kicked out. So there is a tiny background thermal current that you have to deal with. But you're in a reverse bias mode, so you just sit there quiescently with essentially no current flowing through um, the, uh, the semiconductor. When a charged particle comes through, it of course liberates uh, electrons and of course creates holes and these things drift in the field that actually by convention we collect the holes not the electron and uh, then that's uh, processed as a current uh, input to the circuit that, that sits below. Uh, generally speaking if you uh, deposit modest amounts of, of charge uh, that is you liberate modest amounts of charge in the semiconductor the uh, dielectric properties of the semiconductor itself shield the, the holes from the charges so you don't get much recombination. That is, the, the collection efficiency is on the order of about 95%. In this kind of device, there's no amplification in the, the layer itself. That is, even under the, the influence of the potential, you don't get any multiplication of the, uh, the charges. Uh, there are uh, semiconductor devices like avalanche photodiodes where you do actually multiply the, um, the charges, but we don't do that here. Just collect whatever is produced. This is the schematic of the circuit that appears or that is embedded within each pixel and it's within the footprint of the pixel, which is one of the truly amazing things about this technology. That is, all of the circuitry you know, is available for each pixel separately. And so it makes it very powerful. Uh, what you have here is a front end where the input comes in to a charge sensitive preamp. There's actually a, a shaping circuit in there, which we'll talk a little bit more about here in a minute. Uh, there's a test, that you can put a test pulse in, but uh, uh, we, don't, we tend not to use that very much anyway, just use noise to calibrate it. Uh, they, the output from this uh, charge sensitive preamp and shaper goes to a discriminator and the discriminator, by the way, is bipolar so that you can use, it's a very uh, robust chip, you can use positive or negative signals so it doesn't make any difference. You can choose for the application that you want. Um, the discriminator also has a 4-bit digital offset. That is, uh, you have 16 steps of voltages you can apply to the discriminator, uh, and every single uh, pixel on the chip has this, so it's possible to adjust each pixel within that range to have a common threshold so that the, the, the response of the entire chip is very linear. This allows you to sort of uh, null out variations in the capacitance in the input, uh, maybe the resistance in the solder bumps and things like that, so you can get the response of each pixel for threshold purposes to be uh, pretty close to one another. There is uh, an external shutter which is global to the entire chip. What that means is that uh, that's the gate when you can turn it on. So you turn the whole chip on, it takes data while the shutter is high, and when the shutter closes, uh, you stop taking data. Basically, it's applied as a 100 megahertz clock, and you just specify the number of clock pulses. 
So it can be arbitrarily long. You, it comes in external and it's global to the entire chip. So the entire chip has the shutter on or off. Uh, and then when the shutter closes, it automatically reads out the data. The logic in the time picks, this is the heart of the, uh, the chip here, uh, has two input bits which allow you to check, to select one of four logic states which we'll go through. And there's also a separate clock that comes in to the logic which can be used to help digitize the data. And I'll explain what the uh, options are here in terms of, uh, of the logic. Then the output goes uh, to a 14-bit shift register. So you have in each pixel a sensitivity of 14 bits of, uh, of data that you can count before you overflow. And there is an overflow bit which tells you that you have busted out the top. Uh, 14 bits is 11,810. Uh, so you have a, a, de a decimal range of 0 to 11,810, which is quite, you know, quite a bit to be able to look at signals that are coming in you know, to, the, to the device. Uh, this is just to show you that it really exists. This is the layout. The pixels are 55 microns on a side. Uh, this shows you what the uh, circuitry looks like. Uh, it's a, obviously a multi-layer chip. It's a very sophisticated chip, so each of the 256 by 256, 65,000 pixels on this chip have this uh, circuitry embedded in it. And you can see here's the, the counter, the uh, shift register takes up a significant fraction of the, of the chip over here. These are the modes that the logic part of the circuit can, um, can be placed in. The one we use most often is what we call an ADC mode, an analog to digital converter mode. It uses a Wilkinson type technique, which is called time over threshold. And what that means is that, and you'll see a cartoon of this here in a little bit, uh, you produce a shaped pulse, and basically the external clock merely counts the number of clock pulses while the shaped pulse, which is proportional to the charge, is above the discriminator threshold. And so you get an effective measure of the total charge uh, that's present. The uh, time picks mode in the TDC mode, um, what you can do is set the device so that uh, once the shutter opens from the first time that a signal in that pixel exceeds the threshold, it starts counting the clocks until the, the uh, uh, shutter closes. And then you can use it as a hit counter in the so-called Metapix mode. Basically, what you do is you just count the number of times you get a pulse which exceeds the uh, uh, threshold. So you can count, you know, count x-rays, for example, which is an x-ray imaging technique. And there is a, a fourth mode, which basically is just kind of a uh, sort of a dumb Metapix. It doesn't count hits. It just counts, you know, that this pixel has been, been hit. So here's the time picks mode. This is the uh, TDC, the way it functions. If you look over here, the difference between the left and the right is just the clock frequency. This is showing a, a very low frequency clock, and this is showing a, a much higher frequency clock. But this is the shutter. When the shutter opens, time runs across this way, so the shutter opens here and closes here. This is the analog input, and what you get are these shaped triangular pulses. And so the discriminator output that is associated with each one of these pulses is shown here. And so the point is that when you're in the time picks mode, the shutter opens here. And when the discriminator uh, crosses the threshold, you get a, a start of the counting of the clocks. And it, it ends when uh, the shutter closes. So it measures the time. And you can put uh, up to 100 megahertz clock, so the time resolution for each pixel is 10 nanoseconds. It's not like one nanosecond, but I mean, for being able to distinguish things, uh, you know, 10 nanoseconds is usually pretty good. Remember, this was designed for the LHC, and the bunch crossing time is actually uh, the, the, the quickest bunch crossing time is going to be every 20 nanoseconds. So you only need 10 nanosecond resolution, and this will get it. So uh, this, by the way, each pixel is independently programmable. 
that is you you don't have to you know you don't have to make the entire chip a TDC or a tire chip you can make like a checkerboard pattern where every other chip every other pixel is an ADC and the the alternating ones are are TDC so you can uh, select things out that way so you can look at complex images and tell when they occurred during the time that the uh, shutter was open uh, this is the ADC mode this is the one we use to, to measure charge and you see what happens here is that when the shutter is open uh, if a charge is above threshold, then you count, and even if you get a second one, it just continues counting. It just only counts when the, uh, uh, you know, when the level is, the discriminator is above the threshold, and you get an integral of the total number, the total amount of charge. One thing to point out here, and I'll, I'll try and show you uh, an image, I don't know if I've got one, uh, in this presentation, but uh, we just came back from a run in Japan where we were able to use the device to tell some really spectacular physics uh, that's going on. And you see here that if the shutter ends uh, in the middle of a pulse, you cut it off. So the pixel will only record the charge that has drifted into the uh, uh, device by that time. And so you get a, uh, again, you, you get a, uh, a, a fraction of the total charge. And this actually allowed us to look at, like, the early part of the drift. So we could, see, you know, the, the charge is drifting in the silicon, and we get a snapshot of what happens right at the beginning, the first things to reach the detector. And if the same thing can, of course, occur on the front end, that is, you could get a pulse that occurred before the shutter window, and you would then be able to look at the back end of the drift. And so it's a... It's, it's not something that was part of the design of the, the device, but it's allowed us to look at some interesting physics. So this is a cartoon showing the time over threshold mode. So if you get a charged particle that comes into the silicon, produces the holes in the electrons, and they drift, and then what happens is you get the uh, shape pulse. Threshold level compares it, generates a threshold. If the counter clock is a big, long clock, you only get one pulse. On the other hand, if the counter clock uh, is a higher frequency clock, then you get more pulses. So one of the things that we have as a, a knob to adjust the range is the clock. So if you have very large charges that you're collecting, then you can make the clock slower. You give up resolution for small charges, but you can extend your 11,810 to much uh, bigger charges. Uh, so that's one of the knobs that we can turn in terms of adjusting the, the way in which the detector performs. And then you can see if you have a smaller pulse here, uh, you, you know, with the same higher clock, you're going to get, uh, you know, a smaller number. So that's the way a Wilkinson device looks. Just uh, another small point about uh, the actual physical design. The way this shaper works is that you basically uh, raise up to a height of, that is proportional uh, to the total charge collected, and then you have a constant current source which discharges the capacitor. And so by dialing up the uh, amount of current put out by that constant current source, we can effectively change the slope of the decay. And so uh, that, that ability to adjust the slope of the decay also gives us uh, another knob on being able to uh, size up this, you know, where our signal sits in this 0 to, to 11,810 uh, register that we have. So this just is a, another cartoon of the way in which it would respond. You see, if I have small pulses down here that are below the threshold, of course I get no time over threshold ticks, but then as soon as the uh, the, the pulse exceeds the threshold, I start to get a response in terms of number of clock counts. And the point here is that because uh, of the capacitance in the circuit, which you cannot take to zero, uh, you wind up having a rounded top here, and that rounded top translates into a knee you know, on the threshold curve. Once you get up here, then this becomes very, very linear. And so, uh, for us, in the applications we have, actually we want to measure the total charge, and so this being linear helps us do that with great precision. Uh, however, we also want to take a look at the shape of the, uh, uh, the, the footprint of the charge drift as, the drift as the cloud drifts down. And 
but the most sensitive information is actually out in the perimeter where uh, you get the least signal. And so we really do have to do a, a good job of calibrating the uh, uh, response down there where it's very low. And this shows um, actual calibration effort. This is the function that we fit uh, to uh, the curve, and this shows some uh, measurements that were made with calibrated sources. Uh, and we have to, we actually do calibrate every single pixel. We do that with a source, and we then have these parameters stored in a matrix. So when you take the data, you evaluate the charge by essentially uh, running it through this particular function. This shows uh, a result of using, in this case, uh, this is an americium-241 and plutonium-239 sources. And then you just, you get, remember you're, what you're doing is you're summing over multiple pixels because the uh, decay products from, these are alpha particles uh, that are produced. Uh, actually, I think this is the gamma uh, from the, uh, the, well, these are the, the 5.2 and 5.5 MeV alphas. Uh, and what, when they penetrate the silicon and they deposit their energy, uh, then um, you, the, the drift cloud is quite large and covers many pixels. So you have to sum over all those pixels. And this shows you that the resolution we get is something on the order of a sigma of 37 keV in 5.5 uh, uh, MeV. So that's a, a pretty uh, fine resolution. This uh, just shows the ability to get sub-pixel resolution. This is, you know, these uh, Lego plots here are, are showing you how the charge cloud spreads. And you see that, you know, the total area is really going to be under this cone in the middle. And, the, and so when you want the total charge, that's important. But the details of one, you know, type of particle and another are really in this little skirt around the bottom. And, you know, being able to tell one from the other uh, is very important. If we fit the shape, then it turns out that we can actually uh, tell the location of the track to well within one pixel. As a matter of fact, it's so spectacular that uh, by using a laser, let's go back here, what they, the, the point is that a charge particles are very hard to tell where they are at sub-micron positioning. But if you have a laser, you can hit the surface of the silicon and that will uh, call it, knock out some electrons and then you get a drift from that point. But you can measure the laser point very precisely. So that's what's done. This is the setup to show. Uh, and we were able to get uh, a position resolution of the laser hit of 0.32 microns. And this is with 55 micron pixel uh, pitch on the device. That is, as you move that laser spot around, you can fit the drift cloud <laughs> and get the actual position to within uh, a third of a micron, which is actually, uh, you fitting it is better than taking this, the, uh, the, stand, you know, the uh, center of mass, which is the other way people do things. This is just showing that that position resolution is also a function of energy. The less energy you have, the, you know, the, uh, uh, Poor the statistics are, so that's clear. This is just this is sort of a really cool undergraduate lab deal. You just take the uh, the americium source and you put thin mylar foils in front of it successively. So you start ranging the alpha, and you see the energy curve that's left over with, with additional mylar foils put in. So it's a uh, it's really a, a spectacular, very clean device to use. This is showing. Uh, the laboratory I'm back there. This is in Japan, uh, HIMAC. It's in Chiba, which is uh, about halfway between uh, Narita Airport and downtown Tokyo. And it's right on the train line, so it's very convenient. And when I fly over there uh, from Houston, we have a Continental has a nonstop flight. Gets in about 3:30 in the afternoon, and this is a cancer facility. It's primarily used to treat uh, cancer patients. Uh, it's, it's a research facility the Japanese built, which is spectacular. They built it to study the use of heavy ions as a therapy instead of just protons like they do here at MD Anderson. And what they did is they built two rings uh, here. It was actually Hitachi that built them. And uh, one's down in the bottom and the second one is, uh, is above it directly. And the one that's above it 
uh, fills these vertical gantries so the treatment rooms can have beams that come down from above and simultaneously the lower accelerator can bring beams in laterally so they can bring two beams in to treat the patient at the same time. Okay. And uh, the lower beam, they have an experimental floor here that looks pretty much like a normal accelerator experimental floor and that's where we do our work. And what they do is they, they run the uh, accelerator from 7 in the morning till 7 in the evening to treat patients. And then, as during several times in the year, they allow us to come over there and run from 7 in the evening to 7 in the morning. And I can actually get off the plane at 3.30 and take the train into Chiba, check into the hotel, go over to the accelerator, set up the Metapix, and be sitting there waiting for beam at 7.30 or so by the time they finally give it to us. It works out you know, really uh, very well, and it's an excellent facility. Because they built this to study uh, heavy ions as a therapy, they didn't know what they needed. So they built this machine to accelerate up to energies of one GeV per nucleon, <laughs> and they have ion sources that go through iron. So for studying cosmic rays, it's perfect. You know, I mean, it's exactly what we need to look at, for example, simulating uh, the cosmic ray uh, fluences that you would anticipate getting uh, in a spacecraft, something like that, and to do dosimetry work. And uh, they, they provide us uh, marvelously clean beams. This is uh, me, groggy. This was uh, actually uh, uh, just some data that I took, uh, you know, uh, with boron 10 and boron 11. Uh, this shows the device. I actually probably should have brought one with me today, but it's, it's very small. This is just a, um, a prototype mount. This little base thing is about half the size of a pack of cigarettes. And uh, it, this is a uh, prototype board. The chip is mounted here, and this is just some driver electronics. We can, we have, in fact, compressed this entire thing into, let me see if I got the next slide. No. Uh, well, you'll see it in a future slide coming up into something the size of a USB flash drive. <laughs> I mean, the entire thing, the chip and the electronics can be compressed that small. Uh, it's all run off of one USB cable. Uh, we just actually, in this prototype, we piped the high voltage around. The high voltage is generated in the interface. So uh, th that's the bias voltage on the silicon. So there's just one USB cable. And when I use it at the accelerator, I got one of these USB to Ethernet um, converters and so you just have a little USB hub that's powered and then you take the Ethernet and string that cable outside the cave into the counting house and I think I do have a picture of that coming up where I sit to take the data with my laptop. This you see we have it in here at an angle to the beam because what I did is I took data at multiple angles and so uh, this shows, this is actually for the experts at NASA, this is a device that NASA has used for many years to take data on the nuclear cross sections. Uh, and what they have are these old silicon counters that are monolithic, big, they have no position resolution. They just put a target in here and then look at it. So we taped the Metapix to one of their boards and stuck it in there and showed them how you could actually take data with it in their, uh, their setup. Uh, here's the, uh, the one I was telling you about. This is just a, a flash drive. Uh, and this is uh, the what's called USB light interface. So the entire USB interface is actually on this. And one of the things that you can't see is that it actually has an RJ45 cable on it. So if you supply the the voltage, the drive, the, you know, separately with the local uh, cable, then you can uh, plug this into an RJ45 Ethernet and <laughs> just run at Ethernet distances. The chip is here, and all the support electronics is right there. We use it to get the high voltage. Uh, we use a chip from the fiber optic industry. They use avalanche photodiodes to, uh, as the sensors, as the detectors for the fiber optics, you know, for networks. And they, they require a reasonably high bias voltage because the avalanche photodiode does uh, amplify. That is, it does give you a cascade, so you get an amplification in the diode, like a photomultiplier, too. And the um, the point is, they have these chips the, that are, you know, there's one of them on here, that um, will take the five volts and ramp that up to up to 100 volts, and you can digitally choose it. So you can, you know, select it uh, with the DAC on the outside, just to set it up to tell it what voltage you want. Bingo, you get up to 100 volts. 
Here are actually some pictures. This is boron 11 at 400 MeV per nucleon. Uh, this, uh, you know, this is just a color scale here. I mean, uh, this, the data, of course, is actual numbers that are in there. This shows you what the image looks like when you're actually taking data. One of the nice things about this is, of course, you can just cut the frame rate down as the, the length of the frame to whatever you want. So when you get a beam spill, if there's too many hits there for you, you don't have to tell the accelerator people anything. You just shorten up the, the, the shutter window and you can reduce the number of hits. Uh, you see, by the way, that one of the interesting things, these little spots in the background here, are not noise, they're real. Those are gamma rays from the decay off of the, uh, the window to the beam port. That is, is a vacuum line and it has a 300 micron aluminum window on it and we're sitting right there. And so you, what you get is a spill. And the spill lasts for about a second and a half, and then they refill the accelerator and it takes maybe two seconds, two and a half seconds, and you get another spill. And the, the total intensity, I mean, this thing is, is uh, uh, you know, tens of thousands of particles come along on each one, even though we're only sort of triggering on it, taking a few images. Um, the, the particles are still hitting that aluminum and you get lots of nuclear interactions and they leave a lot of those nuclei in an excited state and they decay and you get decay gammas. And if you analyze it, you can actually see the exponential decay curve uh, if you use the Metapix in between the, the spills to take the, uh, uh, to take the hits to show that these are, in fact, real gammas that are associated with the background. So it does see everything. It's really a, a tremendously efficient detector. This is a Lego plot. Uh, here, it, where it, as a log plot, so you can see all the hits, you see the gammas in the background, but here when we have a linear plot, you can see uh, that just the, uh, the charged particles stick out you know, pretty easily, so pattern recognition is not very difficult, and you can get, uh, get everything that you need. This uh, just shows you, uh, just to try and show you the, the variation. Here, the center pixel has a, a, a total count of over 3,000, and yet the ones here on the outside, you see this is the scale. You're getting down here to uh, less than eight hits. That would be four hits for those. So you're counting uh, you know, over a wide range, and you're, you're using that to try and tell what's going on. Th this particular experiment, uh, we had boron 10 and boron 11 at exactly the same kinetic energy. So the difference that you would get is in the velocity, but because of the difference in the mass of one uh, neutron added to the, you know, the, the, the nucleus. And that subtle difference in the total energy we can see, you know, statistically by looking at the boron 10 and boron 11 tracks. This just shows an integrated signal, and you see that you do have a lot of information here. Uh, so it's a log plot. Uh, this is to just show you that uh, you know that we do have angular information as well. Uh, here's a picture of at 60 degrees boron 11. They look like little fish or something swimming along. But what you see is that they actually are heading in this direction. So the, the heavy ionization occurs where they actually enter the uh, the chip and uh, or at the bottom, you know, toward the detector. You see delta rays here, too. You can change the scale, and you can actually see that these are electrons that are kicked out. Uh, here, you see this one looks like, you know, sort of deficient. That's one of those situations where the shutter cut it off. That is, the shutter, and, you know, this is a, a track that occurred very late in the shutter window, and as the charge was being collected, the shutter closed, and so you didn't get all the charge from that one. That's a interesting effect. Then this one, uh, we just had some fun here. We just put the thing perpendicular to the beam and it acts like a nuclear emulsion. You can actually see the tracks as they come roaring along through the detector. You see the delta rays here being kicked out. If you look at this event here, what you see is you see fragments from something that happened, you know, this is two frames, so something that happened off to the left of this frame. Uh, the point is that we actually can measure, since you have 300 microns of silicon and only 55 micron pixels, we can measure the dip angle to within one degree from a single track when we see it. So if you put it in front, if you put a target in front of the single chip and you see a fragmentation where it produces multiple particles like this coming out, you can reconstruct the vertex from a single plane. So unlike 
conventional particle physics experiments that just measure position where you have to do tracking and you have to track back and say, okay, these particles came from, we can have one detector plane. And not only can we get the direction, but we get the charge. That is, we can identify the particle. So you can do the whole experiment with one of these the little detector planes you know, exposed to the, uh, the target. And we actually, I did, uh, in this last trip to uh, Japan, I had some time, so I set an aluminum target up in front and took uh, a lot of data, which we're going to go back and look at and try and demonstrate to NASA that we can actually do this, because you can see everything. I mean, you don't have a magnetic field, so you can't analyze the uh, energy, uh, but you certainly can get the, uh, the particle ID, get the charge, and the multiplicity, and the angular distribution, and those things, which is, uh, allows us to calibrate the, the event generators. This just shows you it works as a, as a dosimeter. Uh, this is uh, 100 seconds sitting on my lap uh, all over the Bering Sea on my way to Japan. And this is a thousand seconds in my office in Houston, so that's a factor of 10 in time. But uh, beyond that, it turns out if you, if you integrate the total charge here, you get another factor of almost 10 uh, in terms of total charge. So you're talking about something that's on the order of 100 times the dose rate. When you know, the Bering Sea is pretty far north, this was kind of off of Nome, Alaska. So that's, uh, you know, you're getting a pretty, and I'll tell you, it's impressive to have that thing sitting on your lap while you're with your laptop open in the airplane <laughs> and just watch, you know, just integrate and just watch the particles, uh, you know, coming in because it plots them real time when they happen. So a dosimeter is something that measures the energy per gram actually a gram of water, but we can calibrate from silicon to water. And so, in effect, if you just sum this and you just got the total number of hits for the volume of silicon, that's a dosimeter, you got the dose. But what's more, we have the angle of the tracks coming down and we can measure the total energy in each track so we can get the EDX. And for those of you who may know something about dosimetry, something called the dose equivalent requires that you modify the energy with the, the kind of particle it was that, do, that, that delivered it. And since uh, we can get the uh, uh, most, the most recent formulas use the actual DEDX, the LET, linear energy transfer, so we can get that directly. So that's possible. Then we've been to downtown to MD Anderson to their proton therapy center. This is uh, one of the treatment ports. This is where they, uh, the beam comes out this way and the patient is put on that table there. Uh, what we did, they have a phantom. This is just a, like an aquarium. They don't have any fish swimming around in it. <laughs> but, but it's just a, a plexiglass uh, container with water in it. And all we did was just get a conventional Ziploc bag, and we put the, the Metapix detector in the Ziploc bag, uh, you know, I mean, without zipping it closed, just to keep the water off of it, and then stuck it down in so that the water pressed the, the, the plastic up close to it. So then what you could do is move it back and forth in there to see uh, the beam. Uh, you know, in a real in situ situation. What they do at MD Anderson now is they actually fill one of these things up and then they put an ion chamber behind it. And then they just integrate the ion chamber and say, okay, this deep in the body, this is what's going on. But in this case, we can take a snapshot form. This is what the tumor sees. These are, this is the, the, they use it, what's called a spread out Bragg peak. They have an absorber that's, with a wheel that's spinning so that they get different ranges of protons to be able to dump the energy across the volume of the tumor. And so you have different energy protons that are present in here. And we can actually see the tracks from the protons. You can also see scatters that occur. And we can also see uh, effects of neutrons. And I'll show you some of the neutron stuff here in a minute. Uh, this is a 10, 10 microsecond snapshot of, of what the tumor sees, yes. How much energy difference it can measure? What's that? How much the difference of energy it can measure? Yeah. I mean, it can see, the detector can see. Well, uh, you know, I mean, if you remember that we're talking about having 11,810 decimal, all right? So if you say, okay, then that's per pixel. 
all right? So let's say you're depositing uh, something like uh, 50 keV per micron or something like that. Then if you multiply that by 300 and you divide that out over maybe 10 or 15 pixels, uh, then you're going to be able to, to take that up to, say, 5,000 on the integrated scale very comfortably. And then one, a difference of one count uh, is going to be uh, typically maybe around 20 electrons in silicon. That's about, say, uh, maybe around 40 MeV, 40 EV rather. So you, you, you can go down to, to uh, about 40 EV of sensitivity if you want to. I mean, so, yeah, you can, you can do a very precise job of doing it. More, more so than doing that, I mean, if you just count the protons, um, then, you know, you, they know what the energy is. We can calculate, you know, it's, it's, in, a, in a way, you know, what the total dose is. Far more important than that, the thing that they don't know is how many neutrons they get because, you know, and, and fragments because they're putting this beam through absorber, through a graphite absorber, and it spreads out. You, so you get uh, multiple scattering, but you also get nuclear interactions. And when you do, short range fragments aren't going to go very far, uh, not from the, the, the absorber, but neutrons will. And the neutrons will go all over the place. I mean, so they'll, you know, you know, rattle around the body. In addition to that, when you get fragments in the tissue itself, then those short-range fragments, of course, will be the energy being deposited there. And you can take, a, you know, a look at that directly. You can see, you can actually see those things. Uh, you get alphas and things like that. Then, one of the things that they were very impressed with is they were in the process of commissioning their scanning beam. Their scanning beam is a very intense beam. It's a, it's a one centimeter beam, which is as tightly as they can collimate it. And what they do is they pulse it and they move it around and they change the energy as they pulse it so that the, the Bragg peak is deposited and they can sort of outline the, you know, the, the tumor. So sometimes they'll give like you know, 25 shots in a raster pattern and they just keep repeating that. But they, they, only, they can't modify the intensity. They just run at full intensity, that's it. So they don't moderate the intensity. And the intensity is on the order of 10 to the eighth protons per square centimeter per second. And so we took this device and we set it in here. And this is, this is 14 millimeters by 14 millimeters. So it has an area of almost precisely two square centimeters. And so this is, this is their one centimeter beam here. And what we did is we wanted to be able to count the individual protons so we increased our bias voltage and closed the ramp down on the uh, on the the, uh, you know, the the feedback current so that we could get just literally counts here. So we could see the proton, see the individual proton, and you see several things. These dark spots are neutrons uh, that have hit uh, nuclei in the silicon, and then you see the scattered particle here. But what's more, you graphically see the halo. You can go out, you're going to go out here and count every single proton in this halo. And so uh, this, this is a 10 microsecond frame that we took, just of their one, you know, a half. We had the center of the beam right there. So this is the half of their, their one centimeter circular beam. And uh, they get to see how spread out it is from the multiple scattering. And they had no, good, no really good idea of exactly what their beam looked like. And literally, we can take a, a snapshot of it you know, for them. And, and the neutron capability, of course, is really good. We're interested in doing a development of this technology as a dosimeter for space radiation, you know, for NASA, build it into the spacesuits and put it in the air as an area monitor. Uh, and so one concern is if you got a solar particle event, you know, could you continue to function during that? It turns out that the kind of fluences you get, the protons of these energies, so it's very, very similar to these energies, that you get is something like 100 to maybe 1,000 per square centimeter per second. And we're sitting at 10 to the 8th at this point. So our detector you know, can certainly function in any bear out in space just looking at what's coming. The detector 
will function perfectly. Whether the readout electronics will survive that is an entirely different issue. You know, because uh, the stuff we're using here, that the readout system is all just COTS chips, that's commercial off-the-shelf hardware. We're not using rad hard stuff in the readout, in the USB readout device. So for flying it in space, we would have to design a rad hard interface detector to get the chip information out, but the chip itself has no problem. And of course, it's not surprising. This thing was designed to sit at the, uh, on the beam pipe at the LHC for years. It's supposed to be able to take 10 mega rads uh, <laughs> before failure. So, uh, it, you know, we're not worried about a space application. Of course, it's a different world, you know, looking at very heavy ions in space. Well, let me move on so I don't bore you people. Uh, we actually are using this at the LHC, uh, not in, I mean, using the Metapix per se, not just the chip. The chip is being used in the central trackers. But where you see these, this is the Atlas experiment um, at, uh, at the LHC. It's one of the experiments looking for the pigs. And what they have is Metapix detectors in the location where you see all these little blue things. In the, to monitor the uh, charged particle and, more importantly, neutron fluences uh, because they want to know what the, the neutron production is like. It's very, very difficult to model uh, neutron propagation when you produce, you know, tens of thousands of particles, you know, per, uh, uh, per 10 nanosecond bunch crossing, or 20 nanosecond bunch crossing. So this is uh, a picture of the detector. Uh, what we've done here is to put uh, different materials over the chip. So there's polyethylene and aluminum, lithium fluoride, and different thicknesses of aluminum here. Uh, and the reason is that what happens when the neutron, you can't see a neutron. Uh, if you're going to see it with a detector, you have to turn it into a charged particle. You have to take the energy from the neutron and make it produce a charged particle. Uh, an easy way to do that, if you have an energetic enough neutron, say at least one MeV or so uh, and up, is just put hydrogen there and then you're shooting pool. I mean, what happens is the neutron comes in, hits a proton and scatters off and the proton, you know, the neutron stops and the proton goes as everybody who's shot pool knows with the cue ball. And so then you see the recoil uh, proton. And so if you put the polyethylene over the top, it will see these high energy neutrons. If you put aluminum in there, then the aluminum will absorb the protons until, until you get really high energy stuff so you can graduate the sensitivity for the neutrons. Then for thermal neutrons, you have to use something like lithium uh, because the lithium will capture the neutron, become radioactive, and spit out an alpha, which is short range, but enough that it will make it into the silicon so you can see the alphas. So. What we have here, let me just go on ahead. This is just a, a bunch of ER. Here, let me uh, show you this. This is thermal neutron. So if you're in a thermal neutron bath, uh, what you see is just the uh, lithium uh, producing the alphas. If you have a 2 MeV uh, stuff, it'll look like this given the, the structure. If you have uh, four MeV neutrons, they'll look like this. Uh, these are real exposures, of course, not simulations. And then if you have 14 MeV neutrons, they'll look like that. And so uh, one of the interesting possibilities is uh, to design a device for Homeland Security. Because you imagine you could carry this thing around, like in your pocket, the size of a, a smart drive. And if you got within, oh, 20, 30, 40, maybe 50 meters of a, of a nuclear warhead, uh, this thing would light up like a Christmas tree for you and let you know <laughs> you saw it. So, you know, if you wanted to search for nuclear materials, you could do that, you know. And um, another possibility is you can make these things wireless, uh, battery powered, and self, you know, contained. And then you could drop them from a Predator drone, you know, just in the woods and read them out with a satellite. You know, just say, just send a signal when you, when you detect a lot of neutrons around, you know, we'll, we'll uh, you know, worry about what's there at that point. So there's a lot of interesting ideas. But you can see that you can very clearly tell the, the difference, the spectral components, uh, with something as simple as this. And we have much more sophisticated designs that are going on. There's two basic dosimeter philosophies 
uh, that have been used in the past. Something called a tissue, tissue equivalent proportional counter uh, is uh, used and flown nowadays. Uh, and what it does is it actually is a gas counter that uses uh, a gas that has a composition that's comparable to human tissue. And so uh, it's effectively, uh, even though it's a gas, you can have a macroscopic volume that has the stopping power of a typical human cell. And so when you fly this, you don't have to do any conversions. You basically just say, okay, if, you know, if I'm looking at under the whatever shielding conditions this device is, I'm actually just measuring what would be deposited in human tissue at that point, period. Okay, so no, no corrections needed. The problem is you don't know what kind of particle it is. I mean, they usually typically employ a cylindrical volume, so the tracks that are coming through can have different path lengths. And so the total charge coming from any single one, um, you know, can be different. So they just use averages. So they have to know something about the, what kind of particles they have in order to be able to evaluate this quality factor. The uh, alternative is to forget trying to simulate the tissue. Instead, measure the radiation. In other words, and that's the philosophy we use with the Metapix. In other words, what we're trying to do is not use a tissue equivalent detector. We're trying to measure everything that's there. We want to completely quantify the radiation field, tell you what the spectrum and composition of the charged particles are, what the photon you know, energy spectrum looks like, what the angular distribution looks like, what the neutron spectrum look like. And once we have done that and set out a complete characterization of the radiation field, then the biologists, the radiobiologists can come along and come up with any algorithm they want to, uh, you know, to say, okay, we're going to calculate the risk from this particular radiation environment, and we don't have to do anything to our detector. We just say, okay, you give me the algorithm, and I'll plug in, because I, I know exactly what the radiation field is, because I've measured it. So that's our, our particular thrust, and so I'll just leave that alone. Let me... Um, uh, this would be the end of the talk. Uh, let me see if I can do this. This, uh, this isn't going to work too terribly swell here because this is uh, this is an emulator, and it's not adjusting to the uh, different pixel size on the screen. Uh, so I'm sorry. This, this is a picture of a charge cloud that we took. And I, uh, you just see the, the dome here. I, I, it's unfortunate that we can't project it. Uh, what we did is put the device in the time picks mode, not the ADC mode, in the time mode. And then what we did is look at the time of arrival uh, of the first uh, charge from uh, different uh, kinds of tracks. And what you see is that the charge cloud forms a ball. I mean, almost a spherical ball, and you're looking at the top of it, because you're looking at the time, and, and then it, it comes down, and so the stuff in the middle hits first, and the stuff that drifts out, which is reasonable. You know, I mean, if it's drifting sideways, and it's part of its, its Brownian path length, it's not going to, you know, come down, even though it's in, a, in a, the same uh, vertical potential. It still makes this ball, and you get this, this uh, feature. So uh, we can measure it. That is, we can actually take a picture of it, so you can calculate it uh, from first principles in terms of semiconductor physics, but people were never able to look at it before, never could take a picture of it, and there it is. And the one, the one thing that I don't have up here, um, that I was going to show you, but I can't do it because I can't see the whole screen. Um, we took data with iron nuclei, 500 MeV per nucleon iron, and in the vertical tracks, the total ionization in the silicon along the core of that iron is so huge because remember the, the ionization goes to C squared. So the 26 of the charge of the iron becomes 626 you know, times that of a proton. So it's like simultaneously shooting 626 protons down through there. And so they deposit so much energy that the number of electrons and holes, the charge density that occurs in this inner region of the cloud, uh, swamps the uh, semiconductor. It exceeds the doping density of the semiconductor material, and it overwhelms the dielectric properties of the semiconductor. And what happens is you get a plasma. You get a core channel there with a plasma, and the difference then is that the charges see each other.
See, in the normal semiconductor, when you produce the electrons in the holes, if they're one or two atoms apart, they won't see each other, so they're not attracted to be able to, you know, to uh, recombine because the dielectric of the semiconductor just shields them all from each other, and they just and they're in an external field, so they drift apart, and you collect them on the. Um, and so it's just if they happen to hit each other exactly, that um, they wind up uh, recombining, and that happens less than five percent of the time. Well. When you take one of these vertical iron tracks, then what you get is a, a core ionization that occurs where you create this plasma and the, the electrons see the holes, and so you get massive recombination. So if you think about making a Lego plot like I did of the ADC where you see the track and you think of it as like being a mountain that rises up, it looks like a volcano. That's why I've turned it the volcano effect. You get a hole in the middle. That is, you know, it comes up to the top and you get this caldera. That is, you get, because of the recombination where the plasma is, once you get out to the outside, you know, it, uh, it starts to become normal again. But in the, in the middle, because you have a vertical track and a vertical, you know, bias voltage on it, um, you get that recombination of the plasma. And what we, we happen to, to get, which is spectacular, is one of these events that cut off the uh, drift right at the beginning. So we saw the early part and the center went to zero. <laughs> that is, the, t the recombination was total. See, when you see the whole drift, you don't see a zero in the middle because the stuff outside diffuses in. So even if you get total recombination in the middle, by the time the whole charge crowd fills up, the stuff on the outside is drifted in and fills up those central pixels with some hits. So you get this hole, you get this dip, uh, and you see that for the normal tracks. But when we took this one that cut it off just after the beginning, so you got the early part of the drift where the outside stuff didn't have a chance to come in, we got a hole, and it went to zero in the middle. And that's a spectacular observation. You, know, that you really are getting a, a complete plasma where everything can see each other and you know, completely recombine. So uh, interestingly enough, uh, one of the people that uh, we work with was complaining, OK, well, that screws it up, because now you're not going to be able to get the whole chart. Turns out, no. <laughs> the 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 hole that you get in the middle is actually proportional to the amount of charge that you produce. So you still can get an assessment of the whole thing. You just have to do a little more physics to get the, uh, to get the thing out, to get the, the final total charge liberated out. At any rate, uh, this is, uh, this is a ton, the uh, Metapix detector. So um, if uh, anybody has any questions, I'll go ahead and answer them. Oh, uh, can you adjust the threshold on these? Yes. Okay. Oh, yeah. The threshold is global. Okay. So that means that you set one threshold for the entire chip. And then remember that you also uh, can adjust the, the threat. Once you set that global threshold, you have this uh, individual adjustment that's six, 16 bits wide. Mm -hmm. uh, and each bit is a linear step in voltage. And you can pick where your threshold is within that and then adjust each individual pixel to use you know anything within that 16 bits of range to linearize the response hmm. so you can then once you've got it got the offsets the offsets are proportional then you can raise and lower the global threshold <laughs> all you want and and, it, and the response is linear hmm. so it's a uh, rather uniform across the entire surface How much higher do you want to go? What do you want to look at? Uh, actually, I mean, it will depend on the energy that uh, how much useful it could be. That's what I'm thinking. Uh, I can't think of, we, we have looked at stopping xenon. I mean, I can't think of an application where you put more energy in than that. Hmm. Remember that we can go down to 10 nanoseconds in the frame. So uh, you can have a, a very high intensity x-ray image, for example, uh, but you don't have to look at, you don't have to integrate over the whole thing. You can just cut it down and, and you only look at what you get in 10 nanoseconds. So, I mean, uh, the point is that the, that when you have this 11,810, if you know you have a lot of energy coming in, you can turn all the knobs that you have and you know, run the frame very short, and you can take this thing up to be able to see the heaviest ions in their Bragg peak. 
And so we can see that with this device. So the question is, what sort of application would you look at that would produce more energy? Yeah, but I was uh, thinking about that. That's a little bit uh, maybe from theoretical physics background, I'm thinking on that. That if we understand the real mechanism of this for the higher energy, uh -huh. maybe we can apply this mechanism to the stellar structures to understand that what could have happened. You know, experiments are different. You know, I don't, well, you mean simulating, a, a, well, I mean, I'm I not sure. Might be a, now, the, the, the thing that, that this does is it explores, you're still in a semiconductor. You're still in silicon. So you're, you're exploring an interesting physics, you know, it's interesting solid state physics because you're going into a region, you know, but, um, you know, you could use uranium ions, you know, we do that. And, uh, you know, down toward Bragg Peak, and uh, people have exposed these detectors at GSI with uh, big fragments like that, and you can still see them. I mean, I'm not sure uh, why, you know, you said, can you extend this to more energy? I mean, I, I think that this, these, uh, you know, if, if there's a direction that we want to go with the sensitivity, it's the other way. You know, I was thinking about mainly because of the radiation effects in the upper atmosphere. Is there a possibility that we might detect, like, you know, for the astronauts or those people, they might see what kind of radiation they can have and all that type of things? Well, we can measure the radiation environment that they're likely to see anywhere. I mean, we can see solar particle events, we can see the heaviest uh, fluences you're ever going to get in the trapped radiation. You know, that would not be a challenge to this detector. Uh, this, you know, none of the radiation environments you see in space. The people who, are, by the way, this, this technology is being looked at uh, as one of the potential imaging uh, plane devices for the Webb telescope. And, and the, what they do is they put um, what amounts to uh, image intensifiers. They put uh, micromegas on the front, which is a, a, a technique with the gas detectors uh, and a, a photocathode, because they get amplification uh, of the electrons that are liberated by the infrared photons. So they can, they can then use the chip to integrate the, the charge that they get from the amplified cascades. So the, the guys at the Space Science Lab in Berkeley are working with this chip for that purpose, for optical imaging. And the next generation of it will go down to 25 micron uh, pixels. It seems like you could also just make like a three-dimensional array, like you actually stack chips on top of each other. And, yeah, and that's and true too. see full. Well, yeah, people have done that, you know, yeah. and uh, the, the beauty of it, uh, you know, is the simplicity. And, you know, while we can think of research applications where we want to use multiple chips, uh, by the way, that USB drive is designed so that uh, these chips can be tiled seamlessly. In other words, you, you know, you can they cut them off and you can butt them up together. And the board that I showed, actually, the reason it's so big is it's designed to take four chips. <laughs> so we can put a quad, and you can get a quad, and that USB interface will read out four of the chips. So you can, you know, stack them together, and you can't see the seams. When you take in pictures with them, you can't see, you know, a crack in between where they co come together. But the USB light is designed so that they can be put up, you know, together like that. So you can have a, a whole row of them, and you can have a second set that butt up <laughs> against them. So you can have two deep, as wide as you want. And the, then the reason is they want to use that for X-ray imaging, you know, for say uh, healthcare x-ray imaging so what they can do is translate that through the field because you can get time information too and since we see individual photons you know we can count photons you're as efficient as you're going to get you know what i mean and what's even more impressive than that is because with the device you can measure the energy you can use a multi-spectral x-ray beam that is, you can use an x-ray beam that has several different wavelengths specifically in it. And of course, each wavelength has a different um, absorption property for specific materials. So there are experiments that have already been done. Of course, they use in the small array, so they, they take pictures of mice. Uh, but what they can do is uh, 
take a, a normal x-ray, a radiograph uh, of, a, of a mouse where they have contrast in the digestive tract. And then they can process that with, by taking into account the different uh, frequencies, because they're measuring photon by photon. You can measure what the frequency of the x-rays that get through are. They can look at that and process it, and they can just make the bones disappear. You know what I mean? So in other words, you can focus in on, on certain aspects of what you want to see. And instead of like, if you've seen a normal x-ray of your chest or something like that, and want to look at the lungs, they can't make the bones disappear. Mm -hmm. You know, you have to look through the ribs. But in this case, they could. They can just use that information to make it disappear. So the rest of the collaboration, all those people on that first slide, uh, are the reason it's called Metapix is that's where the money is. And that's where they're going <laughs> after doing medical imaging doing things like mammograms, reducing the dose, doing a sophisticated multispectral uh, imaging for healthcare uh, applications. Uh, you know, so it's, if people come along and when I give talks like this, they say, hey, you know, you can really do that. I say, yes, yeah, somebody's already thought of that. <laughs> so we're, our interest in this at the present time is not so much to, to jump on the bandwagon with the other herds of people who are doing that with this technology. It's to take it and try and use it for something like uh, dose symmetry of space radiation. So. Yes? What's a delta ray? A delta ray? Uh, when the... Um, um, actually, I can show you a picture one if I can bring it up. When the, when the charged particles come through the, uh, uh, any material, uh, what they do is they ionize the material, they, they ionize the atoms, and uh, they kick out the electrons, and the electrons that are then moving around themselves can ionize further because they have enough energy. So uh, back in the days of alpha particles and beta particles and gamma particles, uh, they actually saw in the cloud chambers, these little tracks that came off of the big tracks, and they refer to those as delta rays. And so for historical purposes, we still call them delta rays. So it's when you have a primary ionizing particle coming through that kicks out an electron, which itself has enough kinetic energy to further ionize and make a track, then it's a delta ray. And so we see these uh, we see these particles. The delta rays are kinematically constrained to you know by the velocity by the beta of the primary particle. So it's it's a kinematic constraint that there's a maximum energy that a delta ray can have depending upon the velocity of the primary particle that comes through. And what this means is that if we want to distinguish uh, tracks. Uh, you know, by energy, the delta ray structure tells us an awful lot uh, about that energy. That's one of the reasons why I want to look at it. And the delta rays, of course, are very low ionizing particles, uh, so that's why we need this the, that skirt in the drift pattern to be able to see very carefully what's going on. But good question. Do you have a question? Yes, my name is Alex Monchak. I'm a continuing education student taking this class which is involved in part about understanding new scientific findings and uh -huh. publishing them. And it's, it sounds like when you're talking about NASA, since you're talking about the astronauts, you're working with the Johnson Space Center. That's true. Which I understand their main goal is to do human space exploration by advancing the technology, eventually letting private industry move forward. And it's been 40 years since NASA has demonstrated the capability of going to the moon, and no uh, no industry has picked up that. And so I was wondering, from your experience, where is the results of the research published, and is anybody pulling all that publication together so that they can see what's been demonstrated uh, to move forward for companies to move forward in space exploration? Well, I think the answer to your question is that. Uh in each individual area, the results are, are you know abundantly published, and instead of having what you know what you might think of as one body of knowledge, which is just sort of the big bolus that's a result of the space program, what you have is you know literally thousands of publications in different areas uh, that take advantage of things like, for example, uh, in electronics uh, circuit design, you know not only NASA themselves, but the contractor companies have come up over the years with circuit improvements. 
um, that have been published and that are available and that are being used. I mean, it's not like, okay, a new company comes along, what do they do? I mean, if it's an electronics company and they have engineers who are aware of the state of the art, then NASA has contributed you know, to those publications that are relevant to those industries. In my business, um, NASA is one of the primary funders of the research that goes on here because uh, it's, uh, you know, it's something that uh, has a, a unique need. We don't necessarily see this kind of environment here on the Earth, but it, it's spin-off. Uh, one of the spin-offs that has come out of this and the people who are working in this field are abundantly uh, aware of all the contributions that NASA makes and are working very closely with the people who uh, have been developing this is the cancer therapy. I mean, the use of heavy ions to treat cancer. The uh, using radiation to treat cancer is, of course, not a new idea, and most of the places in the United States use um, x-rays. That is, if you have a, a, a tumor and you want to get rid of the tumor, there are some other treatments where they actually implant radioactive materials, but generally speaking, uh, IMRT is, is the uh, technique that's used where they, they take a, a focused beam of x-rays and they shine it through the body. Uh, and it passes through the tumor and then they shine it in from a different angle and a different angle and a different angle so that when you sum up the dose, they actually put a, a very large dose on the tumor. And that's the conventional way of doing things. The problem with that technique is that x-rays are attenuated by everything. So when you shine a beam of x-rays through the body, the dose is sort of exponentially decrease, decreasing through the body, and the tumor just happens to be in the middle someplace. Okay, and so, so you're going to damage the tissue on the way in, and you're going to damage the tissue behind the tumor on the way out, and there's no, nothing you can do about that. It just goes straight through. So hopefully, if you come in from what they call enough different ports, then the collateral damage around it is minimized and you get most of the effect on the tumor that you want. Well, the charged particles, uh, I don't know, do you have some chalk or? There should be some chalk up there. We have one here. Can you hear me? Oh, yeah, I get that. Um, if, I, if I plot, Energy loss. Okay, so this is the EDX. That is, it's the rate at which energy is lost. The energy loss per micron of track length uh, versus energy. So energy part. Uh, the curve is a very famous curve. What happens is it comes in here, it becomes minimum, and it goes way up like that. So. Uh, particles which are here are called minimum ionizing particles, and those particles are pretty energetic, like for protons you're talking about almost a GeV per nucleon, so there's a very, very uh, relativistic. But then you have, this is called the Bragg peak. And of course, because the energy is getting less and less down here, it means that this is at the, toward the end of the range. And if you take a heavy ion like a carbon, you know, completely stripped of all its electrons, and you put that into, say, tissue equivalent material like water, this Bragg peak region here is on the order of just millimeters. And so uh, if I shoot this beam in, there's two things that happen. Number one, because of the shape of the curve, on the way in, I have a very low dose. Right? But when I get to the tumor, I get a very high dose. And then nothing comes out the back end because they stop. Okay, so with with protons, unlike the the, the X-rays that, that just ionize all the way through, you know, when I shoot the proton in, my the, what I try to do is stop the proton in the tumor. And so if I stop the proton in the tumor, I'm dumping this huge. And this could be like ten. To, to 20 to 30 times higher than minimum ionizing here. So you're really dumping a huge amount of energy in the tumor. In the tumor. So it's like a, a scalpel, it's a surgical tool. Now you do have some dose coming in, but it, it's a much better, I mean, if you look at uh, the case of uh, an x-ray coming in as a function of depth, if I, if I look at it, the x-ray is just gonna be an exponential thing all the way through the, the body. And if the tumor just happens to be here, well, this is the damage that you're going to get in front and behind it. And so uh, the point is that 
the whole reason for the HIMAC facility in Japan was that people had been using protons, and they're worth just uh, two places in the United States up until recently, uh, Loma Linda in California and uh, Mass General in uh, Boston that had the proton machines. And proton machines were, were pretty widely used around the rest of the world, but the U.S. was kind of slow to pick up on them. Well, the Japanese built the facility that we looked at, the HIMAC facility, to explore uh, using heavy ions, uh, carbon and things like that, treat tumors, the philosophy was that you have a z-squared effect, z being the charge of the particle. So if you have carbon, you get 36 times, because carbon has a charge of 6, what you get from a proton. And one of the things they knew was that even a Bragg peak proton passing through a tumor cell is not guaranteed to kill it. And so you need to have multiple protons pass through that cell in order to kill it. And so the question they asked was a very simple one. How high up do you have to go in charge to kill a cell with one shot? In other words, one Bragg peak particle will be there. And when they built the machine, they didn't know. And that's why they built the machine to have such a wide range of capabilities, because they were going to explore. And they found the answer. And the answer is carbon. That is, you stop a carbon nucleus in a tumor cell, it's dead. Dead is dead. So it doesn't pay to go to oxygen, you know, because you, know, you, you go to oxygen, you have more collateral damage coming in. Well, the Japanese are building these things all over Japan to treat tumors, and the Europeans are building them all over Europe. I mean, right now they're building them in France, in Germany, and in Italy, the heavy ion machines. Of course, now, they don't have to do what the Japanese did. They already know the answer. They're just building carbon machines. And they also know they only have to go up to about 250 MeV per nucleon because they can reach any place in the body that they need to treat. So they don't need a GeV machine, uh, and they just accelerate carbon. And the point is that up until this point, the only place that we ever had the need to understand what these particles did was in space. Because that's the only place you ever saw relativistic heavy ions flying around in people's bodies. And so when this work began, the, uh, the people at NASA were front and center in terms of you know, the interest in reading the publications and looking at the work that had been done and assessing the risks. One of the most important risks is anytime you, you, we know radiation causes cancer, so even though this is reduced, the question is, what's the risk? And it turns out because of the z squared effect, you know, you have a, a potential of, even though it's one particle, of doing a lot more damage to, say, the DNA if you go through the nucleus of a healthy cell before you get in there. So the question is, how much risk do I have, you know, from things like causing cancer, especially when you have a pediatric patient? You know, and you want to say 20, 30 years from now, if I've given them a dose and I've killed the cancer that threatened their life at that point, but caused them to have cancer, you know, 20 years down the road, uh, can we assess that? And that's front and center, the problem that NASA's been addressing, you know, with the risk to astronauts all along. And so that just gives you one example in the field that I'm working in, and I can tell you for sure all the people who do cancer research in this area are eminently aware of all the NASA publications and all the NASA research and work. And as a matter of fact, they are not reticent to applying for grants from NASA to continue <laughs> that work themselves with their machines here, you know, so they can share the, the information they gain from their accelerator experiments with NASA and, and pay them back a little bit. Thank you. Uh, when the program agent or something from outside it, which is a protein, if a proton, I'm sorry, since it, if it is active, it might be a cause of change of isotope or something like that in the DNA molecules or something like that? Um, it turns out that at very low energy, you do get fusion. I mean, uh, you, you actually, you can stick to a, a nucleus. That's how people produce, you know, heavy nuclei. So you can create other nuclei, but the total, you know, given, as my colleagues in France say, Monsieur Avogadro's number, <laughs> you know, I mean, it, it's not, uh, you know, it's not, it's not enough to be clinically uh, uh, important from the standpoint of a hazard. However, it does have uh, a particular benefit that I'm working with the people at MD Anderson and some of my colleagues over in Europe are working on those machines with. Um, it turns out that positron emission tomography, 
that is being able to look at positron emitters from some place in the body. Is when you produce a positron, when a, when a nucleus happens to be uh, a radioactive nucleus of the kind that emits positrons, uh, what happens is protons turn into neutrons and they spit out a positron. And when that happens, uh, the positron is very low energy and it will annihilate with one of the electrons in the body very quickly so it won't go very far from where the annihilation was and so when you get these and the electrons will be pretty much thermal energy at that point so when these two annihilate they produce uh, overwhelmingly back to back gammas and those gammas are 511 keV and they come back you know out straight out at each other. So if you have detectors all the way around that can, can measure those in coincidence and you get the two hits, you can draw a line between those two hits and you know that somewhere along that line was the source. And if you get lots of positron emitters, you draw all those lines and you just, where they intersect, you see where that source is. And so that's a technique that's used, for example, in diagnostic medicine where they give you a tracer of some kind. You take it in and it sticks to some place in your body and then they put you in a pet camera and it takes, which is not something they use on a dog or a cat, but on people, and what they do is then they image where it's coming from so they can see where it sticks. However, during this treatment, you don't need to inject it into the body. What happens is in the protons themselves, as they're going in along, you know, on the input way before they hit the tumor, uh, there is a cross section for them to knock neutrons out of carbon in the body. So the normal carbon in the body can kick a neutron out and become carbon 11 instead of carbon 12. And carbon 11 is a positron emitter. And it can also kick neutrons out of oxygen 16 in the body. This is just the oxygen that's in the molecules in the body. And that creates oxygen 15, which is also a positron emitter. So what we can do is run our Monte Carlo programs, which are designed to calculate those things, and we can predict uh, what the production of, um, of positron emitters along the input path will be. And so what we're proposing is to put positron cameras around the treatment uh, area so that when the patient is in there, and they do a CT scan beforehand and they make up a treatment plan and say, okay, this is where the tumor is, and this is where all the things in the body were when we took the CT scan, and we're going to shoot the beam in here if we have this energy, and if we did all the calculations right, then we ought to fry the tumor. And so then they put the person in there, close the door, turn on the switch, and, and hope they hit the tumor. And they actually do a pretty good job. I mean, they, I'm being facetious here. But the point is, they have no feedback. That is, they, they, they're based upon everything they did in their treatment plan beforehand, and the alignment of the body and everything else, and if uh, the person burps, <laughs> you know, <laughs> then uh, the, you know maybe they're going through a gas bubble or something like that, and, and it's not going in the right place. So if we could put the pet camera around it and predict what the image should be, then the oncologist can watch real time while the beam is being applied and see the positron emission and say, yes, I'm getting the predicted image. So I know that my beam is going where I intended it to go, <laughs> at least you know from the from the treatment plan. So that's a useful benefit of the conversion of some of the nuclei. There will be others produced, but the point is that the total the total number uh, compared you know to the uh, you know a clinical significant uh, amount of uh, uh, you know, transmutation is is insignificant. Inverse uh, beta decay type of process. What will happen to neutrinos? I hope neutrinos are not. Uh, oh, the neutrinos are. are they, they are not. They are not doing. No, you're not worried about the neutrinos, are you? No, because I mean, if they can uh, somehow interact with neutron uh, with the electrons, I mean, that's the only place where neutrinos can interact. Nothing happens. No, 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 no. But the, the neutrino cross section is so tiny that you. Yeah, that. Yeah, there. That's yeah. Where, I mean, if you figure out a way to see the neutrinos that at that those doses, you know, then you get the Nobel Prize. <laughs> Any more questions? Okay. Well, thank you very much. Right, thank, you. Thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.